what if I told you that most of the people in the first century, in the first century, by that I mean when Jesus was here, when he walked this earth, like you are walking the earth right now, Jesus Christ, who we believe as Christians is the Son of God. If you're not a Christian, I'm glad you're here. If you're not a church person, really glad you're here today. But we believe that Jesus was the Son of God. And so what if I told you when Jesus was here and he walked this earth in the first century, there was a church of that time, that most people, majority of people, probably about 95% of people, did not feel at home in the church did not feel welcome in the church. Would that shock you? But that's the way it was in Jesus' day and time in the church. Why was that the case? Here's why. The religious leaders, and I always choke up a little bit when I say that, because I is one of those. (laughs) Um, The religious leaders of the day had turned the church into a rule-following institution first. It was about keeping the rules, and you had to keep all the rules, and you had to keep them perfectly, and if you could not, then you were not welcome in the church. So that's what it had turned into, was a rule-following group of people, institution, and obviously there weren't many people who could do that. And so most people felt unwelcome in the church And they felt also, this is usually what happens, not always, but a lot of times what happens to somebody who feels not welcome in the church is they feel far from God as well. Well, heck, if that's the way it is, if that's the way it's going to be, then, you know, God must not welcome me either. Because last week I said that the church is kind of heaven on earth, it's supposed to be, and we're supposed to be like speaking and sharing the love of God. We are the message of God to this world a whole other thing, but that's what the church is supposed to be, and the church is people. It's not buildings and institutions and religion and stuff like that. It's, it's us. And so the religious leaders had turned it into that. Now, just to note, and you know this is true, if you're like, some people kept it perfectly. No. No, they just acted like they did. They did this. Right? What do we call this at Quest? If you're new, church face. All right? Thank you. You've been here a long If you've been here more than a week, you may have heard of church face. I hate church face. Amen, don't you? You hate church face? Church face is, hey, how you doing? And by the way, some of you sitting on the front row are brave because last week I brought other people up here to wear another church face. So anyway, I'm not going to do that today. But they wore church face. Church face is when you act like you have it together even though you don't have it together. You ever seen somebody like that? I've been like that. I've acted at times like I had it together. I've had just outright blatant sin in my life, me. And then I've stood up and told you things about God and act like I don't have it together and haven't confessed those things, right? I think we do that. And that's what was going on um, in that day and time. So they didn't, even the religious leaders, the church leaders, didn't follow the rules perfectly. They just acted like they did. Jesus had very harsh words for people like that, all right? He wasn't mean, he wasn't unloving, but he had very harsh words for them. For people who wore church face, who acted like they had it together, for religious rule followers in the first century, basically the church and the church leaders of that day and time. He didn't have harsh words for them, listen, because they tried to follow the rules. Jesus is not against following the rules. Don't take this message in the wrong direction. Sometimes we love to go, oh, this is awesome. I can do whatever the heck I want. All right, I'll just say it that way. Um, because Jesus loves me. We love that message. Jesus loves me. I can do anything I want. I don't have to follow any rules. That's not what, it, that's not what we're saying. It's not that Jesus didn't have rules. God himself gave 10 commandments and all these things, right? But when it became about the rules and when everybody was trying to follow the rules and that was made primary, what happened was, and this happens to you and I, whenever we follow one rule, we look down on everybody else who does not follow it, don't you? Don't you? The only person I know who followed the rules perfectly but didn't look down on others was Jesus. We tend to (laughs) look down on other people. If we get one thing right, they have everything wrong. So they had made it their religion to follow the rules instead of a relationship with God, and it made them judgmental towards other people. 
Um, if you want to hear Jesus's words, I'd encourage you to check out Matthew chapter 23. I'm not going to read it to you. The whole chapter is basically Jesus talking to the church, the leaders of that day, who were all acting like they had it together, and he was telling them what was up. His words were, you'll read his words, if you bet, and you'll be like, holy cow, that's Jesus? Yep, those are words in red. Whenever you see red words in the Bible, they say, that's Jesus' words. We just turn them red, right? But those are Jesus' words. And so he's, the whole chapter, here's what he calls them over and over. You know what he calls them? Hypocrites. Y'all are a bunch of hypocrites. Because you say one thing and do another. You act like you have it together when you really don't. You don't help anybody get to the kingdom of God. You just keep them away from it by the way that you live. The word hypocrite in the Greek, I looked it up. You know what it means? Actor or mask. Mask. It was from the dramatic plays and stuff they would do. So to be a hypocrite was to be an actor. Many of us in the church can be actors. Acting like we have it together when we really do not. Jesus' biggest problems, his biggest problem, not problems, but problem with the religious hypocrites were this. He sh they shut the door to his home. Last week I talked about how Jesus said, I'm going to make a home for you. And then I talked about how in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus prayed that we should bring heaven to earth. And so that means church should feel like home to people because heaven's going to feel like home. Amen. Do you think it's going to feel like home? Of course it is. And so Jesus says, well, pray those things here. Let that happen here. And so we should welcome people and open the door and all that kind of stuff. And what the religious leaders had done was shut the door to people and kind of thrown away the key and said, hey, hang out in the yard. And once you get it together, once you dress the right way, act the right way, follow all our rules, check off all the boxes of doctrine that we have, have the exact theology we do, blah, 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 blah. Oh, oh welcome. Welcome. We got a little check-in thing over here to make sure you're following everything. But welcome, right? And so people were like, no, thank you. They were far from God and far from church community because of it. So if you're here today, I wanted to say this, and this has been your experience, and maybe it has. Maybe you feel, maybe you have felt unwelcome in the church. I don't know. Maybe in this church. As a church leader, as a pastor, I want to say to you, I am so sorry. On behalf of the church, not just this church, but the church, we should apologize for that and say that's not the way it's supposed to be. Because the first thing you should feel in the church is welcome. The very first feeling anyone outside the church ought to feel inside the church is welcome. Do you agree with that? It's a challenge, right? That's the first thing. And it is a feeling. It's something they should experience when they're with us. It's the very first thing. But so often we're too self-focused, we're too self-centered for that to happen. If the first thing people feel is, hey, I'm not dressed the right way, or you know, I'm not acting the right way, or if you knew this about me, or you knew that about me, or if I shared my real story with you, then we really haven't been the church. And by the way, it's not just in here, it's out there. So often, we do some things in here that we don't do out there. So as soon as you leave this place, and you go out there into the world, it ought to be the same. Amen? Amen? Y'all with me? As soon as we leave this place, whatever we're saying is important in here, whatever we're doing in here ought to be the same thing that we're doing out there. And Jesus came to bring that kind of reality to the church. He came to change things. He, he came to say, it, we're not doing it the way it's supposed to be done. And so Jesus came to open the door. And so what I want to do is I want to share a couple places in Scripture um, where Jesus brings this new reality out, all right? Just two quick places, and I'm going to link these together. These are just two instances. The first is going to be an experience Jesus has with religious leaders, all right? Some of those people, 
like from Matthew chapter 23. I encourage you to read that chapter. I mean, where he's just like, you're hypocrites. You're acting. You're not helping anybody. You're shutting the door. And I've come to open the door. Right? So the first scripture is going to be um, a conversation where Jesus talks to them. Um, and then the second one is going to be just a conversation he has with his, his disciples, his followers. So the first is uh, Jesus and an encounter with the religious leaders of his day. All right, so these are going to be the rule followers who had shut the door, um, who couldn't keep it, I mean, who were trying to keep it all together perfectly, but they really couldn't. All right, so if you have felt, un let me just share with you real quick before I get into that. If you felt unwelcome in the church, if that's you, then I want what I'm talking about today to be a comfort to you. But if you are a part of the church, this message is for two different groups of people. I'm trying to speak to everybody today. If you are a church person, you have been in the church, um, then maybe this should be a challenge to you. So I pray it's a comfort for some people, but man, I pray it's not a comfort for everybody. <laughs> There's some of us it needs to be a challenge. So here's the scripture, one of my favorites. Y'all have heard me preach on this before if you've come here. Luke chapter 15, it says this, tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law, and by the way, that was the church, all right, complain. Stop there for just a minute. So <laughs> Jesus is doing something, and we believe he's God in the flesh. If you're a follower of Christ, if you're a Christian, it's God in the flesh, He's doing something, and the church complains about what he's doing. Do you find that kind of odd? Anybody? Right? Kind of weird. They complain that he was doing what? Well, he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. So Jesus tells them a story. So what's going on here? The context is this. Jesus is hanging out with sinful people. All right, let's call them, can we call them non-religious people? Would you agree with that? They're, if the religious leaders are the church, or the religious people are the church, the non-religious people who aren't keeping the rules, aren't even trying to keep the rules, most of them, right, are repelled by the church, they, they are hanging out with Jesus. And the church leaders find this odd. So the religious people find it odd that God in the flesh, and they didn't believe he was God in the flesh, but he was God in the flesh, would hang out and associate with such sinful people. Some translations here say scum. All right, so that's how bad, th that's how they saw them. So Jesus was hanging out with these kind of people who couldn't keep the rules and they weren't welcome in church because of this. And so Jesus does something crazy. What does he do? He eats with them. You might find that odd, like it's all right to eat with somebody, even if they're kind of messed up or non-religious or whatever. But actually, in that day and time, if you ate with somebody, if you had fellowship with somebody at a table, it was a really big deal. It, was mean you, it, it meant you accepted them and you welcomed them into your family. And so here we have the God of the universe eating with these people. They can't keep all the rules. They're not welcome in the church because of it, and yet you have Jesus hanging out with them, eating with them. So Jesus is kind of crazy, right, for doing this. Now, these are not just sinners. You notice what it, there's a word before it. What's the word? Notorious. Do you know what that means? They're famous for their sin. I love this. So it'd be like me, and you know everything about me, and you're like, oh, John, that guy who does such and such. Do you know any people like that? Do you identify any people not because of who they are, but because of their sin? We do that, don't we? We forget that they're people, and we just call them by their sin, right? So they're notorious sinners. And what's the deal with tax collectors? Well, they were seen as really bad people in that day and time, because they, they collaborated with the Roman government and took money from the people. So that's the context, and they can't keep all the rules. And so they, Jesus is hanging out with them. Now, if this, doesn't, if this doesn't rock your world theologically, I, I don't know what will. This ought to mess with us, right? This seriously ought to mess with us, because here we have God who hangs out with broken and sinful and especially 
non-religious people. God is opening the door to sinners, non-religious people. Who was closing it? It was the religious leaders of that day and time. In fact, just a side note, I want to do a whole other message on this or a series or something, and I couldn't get away from this, and it's too much, I know, but I just have it kind of, there, there's a lot today, by the way, but I, there's just a little bit in here. I was like, all right, so this is crazy. If you look at this, it says what? That the people, the sinners, the non-religious people who weren't acting like they had it all together, they came to Jesus, He didn't even have to go to them. They came to him. What does this tell us about Jesus? It tells us this. Listen, he was attractive. He was attractive. And so it it reminds me that I ought to be attractive. I don't feel very attractive. But in Christ, I can be. And so I want to do a whole other series, or at least I just wanted to give you the bottom line on what that message would be. It's real. I mean, this is just extra. You don't have to, all right, you don't have to pay for this. You ready? Here it is. Only attractive people are allowed in church. Amen? Y'all are like, what? Only spiritually attractive people I had that allowed in church. And... It really bothers me, friends, that so often we as the church and we as Christians sometimes are not very attractive. And we can be pretty ugly, actually. Because instead of inviting somebody to heaven and loving them into the kingdom, we would rather send them where? To hell. In fact, we almost see it as a notch on our belt. I told them and they didn't accept it type of thing. You with me? And so I preached to those people, yet they didn't receive it. Maybe it's because we weren't attractive in our method. (laughs) Maybe our method was kind of ugly. So often I call that megaphone Christianity, where I want to stand on the corner and yell at people and tell them what's up, and it's a one-way conversation. It's not really a conversation at all where we're going back and forth. I'm not willing to actually be in relationship with you at all. So as a church, we need to be attractive. And I know some people, church people, we struggle. Like, yeah, but we got to tell people what's up. (laughs) Did Jesus tell them what's up right when he met them? Be careful telling them what's up anyway. I mean... There's lots of scriptures that say, hey, there's a big old log in your eye and you're pointing out a little splinter in somebody else's. I'm not saying that we don't hold people accountable. I'm not saying that we don't talk about sin and that when we see it. But remember, the first thing somebody outside church ought to feel and experience when they're in church is what? Welcome. Did you see the scripture? That's what Jesus was doing. They felt Welcome. So then it says, go back to the scripture. So Jesus tells them a story. That's his reaction, right? And you've heard me preach on this, and you've heard me say, if you've been here longer than probably a month, this is my favorite chapter of scripture. It has been for years. And if you're like, I've heard this before, well, you need to hear it again. So do I. So I love it so much is because it's such the gospel, because it starts out with the context that Jesus was welcoming sinful and broken people, non-religious people. The first thing they felt with him was welcome. They were attracted to him, not repelled by him. And when they would sit down with him, the church would look at it and complain and go, what the heck are you doing? Why would you associate with people like this? Don't you get what the church is supposed to be like? We're religious. We keep the rules. We got it all together. So Jesus is like, here, here, I'll answer you with some stories. And so he tells three stories. You've probably heard them. I've talked about them. The first one is about a shepherd who has 100 sheep. He loses one, kind of wanders off. And it says the shepherd leaves the 99 to go after the what? The one. To go get the one sheep and bring it back. Now, I love that. The shepherd goes after the one sheep, and then what does the shepherd do? The shepherd brings the sheep back to community, right? So the shepherd goes out and then brings the sheep back, and there's much rejoicing. Is that what we do when somebody wanders off and is brought back? We're like, I can't believe they're back. (laughs) Do you know what they did? Put them on your prayer list. (laughs) 
right? That's what the, the next story, Jesus tells another story. He's like, or hey, if you didn't catch that, because he's given a picture of God and God's love for people, that he is so loving. You don't understand why I'm hanging out with these people? It's because God leaves you to go after them. God loves them. I am that. Jesus Christ, the great shepherd, have come for the, the one. You guys don't even care about the one. You repel the one. I'm attracting the one. So then he's like, well, if you don't get that, it's like this. A woman has 10 coins. It's like her dowry back in that day and time. She loses one of them in one of the floorboards of her house. It falls under her house. So she rips the house apart and spends a lot of her other money to search out and find it. So by the end, maybe she spends four of the coins of the 10 to find the one that is lost. So she has like, what, six now because she found the one. And you're like, that's dumb. You had nine. It's better than six. But that's how God is. He'll spend resources to find us. He loves us. He'll, he'll come after us like that. Or finally, that last story, a father who stands at the edge of his porch and his feet are hanging off. And I know y'all get nervous when I do this. But the reason his feet are hanging off is he's just waiting, waiting, waiting for what? His son to come home. Because his son had rejected him, had rejected the family, had cursed in his face, basically. Had gone off and lived a very sinful, broken life. Had spent all of his father's money on crazy, wild, living prostitutes, all this, gam all this, anything you can think of. That's what he did. And then he comes back home. And the father standing on the edge of the porch. And the first thing the father does when he sees the son who finally returns home is he runs out and beats him over the head. You idiot! Like, you couldn't keep none of the rules. No, that's not the, if you're worried, that's not the story. <laughs> he embraces him and loves him and says, welcome home, son. Well, I need to be your servant. I can't be your son. I just preached on this a few weeks ago. You're not my servant. You're my son. Welcome home. Big party for him when he comes home. All of this to say, Jesus is like, he, I think he looks at the religious leaders then, he's like, any questions? Y'all got any more questions? I think they walk away ticked. Doesn't say what they do, but it just moves on to Luke 16. And Jesus turns back and he's like, hey, what were we talking about? And they're just enjoying a meal together, tax collectors and notorious sinners in the community. Crazy. So I know you're like, well, so, so what you're saying, preacher, is no matter who comes in here, we're supposed to welcome them. Yes. Well, what if it's so-and-so? Yes. What if they? Yes. But yes. Y'all get it? Because that person's coming, I promise you. The one that you're like, no, they're coming. God's big like that, and he's probably going to use you. And they're going to be shocked, too, when you're here, probably. Has that, has that happened to anybody here? It happens, doesn't it? Maybe even today you're like, I just saw so. Oops. So I want to jump to that other scripture I mentioned. Jesus, right before he dies, all right? This has happened, and you jump over to John's gospel. Right before Jesus dies, he wants to be sure that his disciples understand exactly what he wanted to say. So these are some of his last words. It's like he wants to be sure they get it. And so he wants them to know what the church is really supposed to look like. And so he, he shares something interesting with them. He says this in John chapter 13, a new command I give you. This is weird. I would start with that. Like the first day I meet somebody, hey, I got a new thing I want to tell you about. But Jesus ends with it. He's already spent three years. It's just his followers now, right? He's gathered for that last supper, we call it. He just has washed their feet, by the way, in the story. They had dirty feet, and Jesus played the role of servant. And this is after that. And so he knows he's about to die. He's getting ready to go out to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane. The next day, he's going to be arrested and put on a cross and die for them. And he says, look, a new command I give you. And I think they're going, we've been with you three years, man. New? <laughs> you didn't give it to us yet? What are you talking about? It gets even stranger because this is his command. Love one another. I think at this point they're a little disappointed at Jesus. They're like, D we got it. We got that. 
You've told us that. We've seen it. We've seen what you've done. But Jesus is like, this is new. He could have just said, a command I give you, or a reminder I give you. But he said, no, a new command I give you. Why is it new? You know why it's new? Because Jesus is about to describe what it looks like, and they've never seen love like this. And so he ends with saying this, as I have loved you, as I am about to love you, so you must love one another. There's no place for hate in this kingdom. There's no place for, I don't like that person in this kingdom. Love one another. There's no place for racism in this kingdom. Amen? There's no place for, if you don't agree with my political persuasion, you ain't a part of this family in this kingdom. Amen? Just come up with it, whatever you want. There's no place for that in this kingdom. John, John, John! You're dancing on the edge of, of, of destruction. Be careful. We got to hold people accountable. I'm not saying we don't. <laughs> I'm not saying there aren't rules. By the way, Scripture says so much about the only place you hold anybody accountable is actually in the church. Once they've made decisions to say, this is what I want, and you're very aware of that. And so then you help each other to follow Jesus. Remembering, I think at all times, that none of us are Jesus. Are we? Anybody, does anybody think they're Jesus in the house today? <laughs> yeah, you do. Just like I do. Because I think I'm right. Jesus was right, by the way. It's just that he actually was. And... So be very careful, even with your judgment of people in the house. It does use that. It does say we are to judge one another. It's not the kind of judgment you're thinking. It's loving, helping people follow Jesus the correct way, all right? But it's a new command because of what Jesus is going to show them. It's love on a whole other level. So you've got to love each other. All right. I got to close this thing. How many of you guys, and you don't have to put your hands up, but how many of you have doormats at your house? Probably most of you, right? Do you know that every church, every church has a doormat? Every church. Now, lest I leave you in that, I'm not talking about an actual doormat, spiritually speaking. There's a doormat out front of our church. There's actually a doormat in front of you everywhere you go. You're like, what? This is weird. Here's what the doormat can say. Welcome. 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 Or it can say this. That can be the doormat of our church. That can be the doormat of your life. I don't like this one, so let's get rid of it. Go back to the other. We always say, I've said it to people, don't be a doormat. You ever heard that? Don't be a doormat. I have to change my theology today. You know what I want to say to you? Be a doormat. Be a doormat. Just be a welcome doormat, amen? Be a welcome doormat, amen? Y'all hear me? It's okay. You're like, are we allowed to clap? Y'all crack me up. Be a welcome doormat. Some of you are like, you, you shouldn't say be a doormat, man. I can't, people aren't supposed to walk on me. Jesus Christ became the welcome doormat for the world when he died on the cross. He was laid out on the cross. His hands were nailed. His feet was nailed. He had a spear in his side and he was bleeding to death. He struggled to take every breath. Do you know this? He died of 
he couldn't breathe because he couldn't lift his body another time. Jesus became the welcome doormat for the world. And if you want God, if you want to be home, which God wants you to be, you must cross the threshold. His name is Jesus. He's the welcome doormat for you to get home. Amen? And friends, we are Jesus followers. I'm not a fan of the word Christian. Y'all know that. We are Christians. I get that. But everybody's a Christian in the South. Can I get an amen? I mean, give me a break. Are we all, I mean, we need to be Jesus followers because what Jesus followers do is they do what Jesus did. And what did Jesus do? He became a welcome doormat for the world. Am I passionate about this? Yes, I am. Because you know what? I need you. We need, this church needs to be attractive and we need to be a welcoming doormat. You guys have been, you continue to be. I don't know what we're going to do about it because God's going to keep bringing people into this community of faith. It's not about numbers. It's about people and people matter to God. He continues to grow things here and we have to be, I'm telling you, if we keep laying out the welcome doormat, people are going to come because they want to experience God's love. It has nothing to do with just church services and religion and programs. Amen? It has to do with them knowing that God loves them and they're accepted home into his family. And so, friends, we are called. We have one more service, don't we? We are called to be a doormat. You saying I'm supposed to let people walk on me to get to Jesus? Amen. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Man, I got to spend some time. I got to spend some energy. I got to spend some money. I got to, it's going to mess up. So, Amen. Cost Jesus his life. You think he was like, man, this kind of stinks for a Saturday, Friday. It's what he did. It's what we're called to do.